and thank you first of all for the invitation to participate in this um, today. I'm really looking forward to the discussion later. The first point that I wanted to make um, is that development is fundamentally about human dignity and sometimes in these discussions I feel like that point gets lost a little while and the post-2015 agenda has to be about enabling people to flourish as active, productive, participating citizens and that's um, whether they are to whether you're talking about the village that they live in or whether you're talking about the kind of global community that they operate in and this is something that's particularly relevant to young people so that's kind of how I want to frame um, the discussion if possible for today. And the second point is that with youth participation, I think this comes out really strong from what Victoria was saying, is that it's not only about having more financial and technical resource allocated to young people, but giving them the ability to influence allocation, distribution and political prioritisation. So youth participation doesn't mean more decisions made about us, it means about more no decisions made with, uh, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> it means no decisions about us without us. And I think that's something that's really fundamental in the post-2015 process. Um, one thing that I, I think potentially has um, kind of transformative uh, capacity for the future is making the most of the leaps and bounds in technology. And I know that restless development have done a lot to contribute how um, that can influence the post-2015 agenda, particularly in the way in which the networks that young people build around the world, and whether that's part of a civil society campaign or an organisation, or just as individuals themselves. Um, an ICT shouldn't be seen only as data collection, but also as important for knowledge dissemination, empowerment and engagement. But when we have these conversations, it's also really important to think about the people who are excluded from these networks and opportunities. I think, obviously, we're all aware that sitting in London, we're, we're going to participate, um, I think, through Twitter questions later on. But some of the people who really need most to be involved in this discussion don't have the opportunity to engage through those means. Um, the involvement of people has to be meaningful. And one of the things that was interesting in conversation with Millicent earlier, she said that some of the um, difficulties that they had, I'm sorry if I'm hoping I'm not going <laughs> to uh, overlap too much, but some of the difficulties that they had with the consultations was for young people to respond to the 11 themes that were set by the UN. And we have to be careful that the UN consultations don't shape the way in which young people are able to express ex their experience of poverty, but the people are able to express <coughs> their experience of poverty and marginalisation, and that shapes the consultations and the perspectives developed by the UN. Um, so I think I'm going to wrap Thank up, um, but with just on the final point is that we've got Friday as the public launch of the report. And what will be really interesting is this has been um, credited as the most consultative UN process ever. And what will the youth constituency do if all of their efforts aren't reflected in that report? And I'd be really interested to have that as a topic of discussion later.